Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, we are recording this, so if you have other colleagues or people you'd like to share it with, you can send it to them. Um, but we'll get started since it's a little bit past the hour. Um, just to start us off and welcome you all, my name is Megan Young. I'm the Associate Director for the Opening Minds Through Art Program, which is housed out of Miami University's Scripps Gerontology Center in Oxford, Ohio. Um, and I think I'll pass it to Krista to introduce herself next. Hi, everyone. I'm Krista Peterson. I'm the Assistant Director of OMA. I'm located in Cleveland, Ohio, though, um, a little north of the university. And hi, everyone. My name is Amy Elliott. I am the new interim director for OMA, uh, taking over after our, our indelible, incomparable founder, Lika Lokan, retired at the end of the year. My background is in research and evaluation of person-directed innovation and long-term care, specifically the processes and outcomes that support autonomy and relationships, and OMA embodies all of that. So it is my pleasure to be here today. Great. And then Renee, I don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself now or later. <laughs> I'll just say hello. My name is Renee Griffin, and I'm the Creative Aging and Partnerships Officer at Senior Services in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Thank you. So welcome again. I see some familiar names, so we're glad that you're joining us. Um, just as a recap, this webinar will talk a little bit about what OMA is, for those who may not know a lot about the program um, we'll hear from Renee about how they've kind of implemented it in their project they had going on um, with their grant funding and, su and supported projects. And then um, we'll talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty about what we can offer you through OMA and also things to keep in mind as you plan to submit grants or thinking about finding funding in your community. So I'll get us started just, and this might be a uh, something some of you have heard many times before, but OMA stands for Opening Minds Through Art. It's an intergenerational art program for people living with dementia. And it was developed, um, like Amy said, at uh, by Dr. Elizabeth Lika Lokan in 2007 as part of her master's thesis. Um, and she, she put together her knowledge of gerontology, education, and art, and combined it and created this program. Um, I think the OMA part actually came first, which actually means grandmother in Dutch and German, and then the opening mind art part came after. Um, it's been replicated in over 200 locations, so across the United States, but we're also international as well. We have um, training centers in Indonesia and Canada, which is very exciting that it's beyond the U.S. Um, and impacting the world at this point. And then here locally at Miami University, we've served over 2,500 students, but as you can imagine with over 200 locations and over a thousand facilitators who have come and been trained in our program, um, many, many more volunteers have participated than that. Um, the program, like I said, when Lika was developing it, she visited nursing homes and found a lot of these uh, typical arts and craft projects, and a lot of them look like more preschool type activities. So things you might um, see are commonly done in nursing homes might be something like these projects. Um, but she felt that these didn't um, live up to the standard of honoring someone's skills and honoring the the um, choices and the things that they can still do and still make. And so if you think about how difficult it can be for someone living with dementia who may have some cog cognition challenges to remember where an eyeball goes on a jack-o'-lantern or color in the lines when the lines could be blurred in their reality. So it's um, these projects don't often um, lend themselves to people being successful and we, at, in the OMA program want people to feel successful. And so that's um, the whole premise. And we think about what people are capable of and what they can achieve. So that's kind of the foundation of why the, the art activities that we'll show in a second, the artwork, um, why it looks that way. But our mission at the core is to build bridges across age and cognitive barriers through art. So we do that, we connect um, people of different ages, 
people of different um, cognitive abilities. And um, sometimes it's older people of the same age working together, but one may have dementia and one may not. Sometimes it's caregivers um, working with their care partner. Um, and oftentimes in our case, it's younger people working with older people. So we just are a big fan of bringing people together, building that community. Um, and we do that through art-based activities. So I wanted to provide a quick overview too, when you, you'll hear different kinds of vocabulary um, in our presentation today. So just so that you understand the different roles that everyone serves in the program. So the OMA volunteer is, um, could be a student, a community member, people from volunteer groups. Um, oftentimes, again, for us, it's uh, students as students at colleges or universities. So those are the people that will sit one-to-one -one and interact with an older adult. Um, they go through about a two to three hour training, which we'll describe a little bit later. And they, they learn how to sit and help and assist in a way that's not um, uh, overbearing. And they, they let the artist and the older adult experiment and play during the session. So then you heard me say artists. So the middle picture there are artists as the older adult, um, typically people living with dementia. OMA is starting to be thought in different ways with different populations, but traditionally we've worked with um, older people living with dementia in nursing homes. So those are our, what we would define as our OMA artists. And then the OMA facilitator is the person who is behind the scenes, who gets together all of the information about what projects are going to be doing, um, handles managing students, making sure students are coming in, make sure that there's artists that are going to come participate, just all of the background um, running and getting the program up and running. So that's that's your OMA facilitator. So there's three different kind of roles that are vital to the success of the program. Um, as far as the OMA structure and what it looks like over several weeks. So like I mentioned, volunteers are um, trained. They go through about a two to three hour training to learn how to support the creative um, ability of the artists that they work with. It's a one-to-one -one partnership and we like to keep those partnerships as uh, the same as much the same as possible. So we hope that the same person, the same volunteer will always volunteer with the same artist for several weeks. You can see there it says 10 to 12 weeks. That's an ideal, but sometimes programs are shorter, sometimes they're longer, just depending on the availability of both parties. Um, and every week, the goal is every week for that set amount of time, they will meet and they'll do an art project together. Um, and various art projects are available. We'll talk more later too about that. But every week they try to do and accomplish a new project. So there's always something new and exciting to look forward to for both parties. Um, they're always intrigued about what, what the next thing is, what the new thing is they'll do that day. Um, so I think that's it about the structure, but as far as the artwork goes, you'll notice behind a few of us, we have images um, that OMA art is inspired by modern abstract art. So we took that traditional kind of activity and flipped it on its head. Um, and we use artist grade materials to create these really vibrant, beautiful, um, lots of texture, lots of shapes, colors. Um, we use a variety of paints and inks and dyes and paper. So you can see that while all of these are different, um, everyone follows the same process. So these are all different projects, but if you were to hand a project sheet out to the room, um, you would end up with very different products, unlike those jack-o'-lanterns where everyone's making the same thing. So these, just to show you some variety of examples, um, the artists get to name all of their artworks too, so it's kind of a fun um, way to see their creativity and see what inspires them and what they're thinking of as they're creating. I believe this one's called Firecracker, if I remember correctly, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, 
But then at the end of the semester, at the end of the time together, there's always an OMA art show that kind of showcases what um, friendships are formed, the beautiful artwork created. And it's just a time for the community outside of those pairs of individuals to really celebrate the success, the triumph, um, you know, what of what's been created beyond just physical artwork, but also relationships. So here's just a few images from some art shows in our area. As you can see, it's very busy. Um, lots of people gathering and families will come. Younger volunteers will invite their families. Older adults will invite their families. So it's just a really big party. But I will, I'm gonna show a quick video. If you watched our, our main video before, you've probably seen this many times, but just for the sake of those who may not have seen or heard of OMA before, um, just to learn a little bit more. People with intact cognitions oftentimes try to free ourselves from the limitation of having to draw this thing that looks like that, you know? And when you are free from that, you can then break into the abstract world more directly. So when the ability to express is impaired, they think the content is gone. And that's where the violation of human rights come in, because the human is still there. It's just that they are locked behind the disease. It doesn't mean that there isn't somebody in there that's trying to express. And so art is a sort of a, a channel when logical thinking and verbal expression is impaired, art is still there for them to express. And when I see what I do, and I realize how it comes out, I'm, 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 I'm besides myself. You will know Working with people to mention, learning more about it, not just via textbook and what you see in movies, how it's portrayed, I guess. It's changed my experience at Miami because now it's everything that I do here. So I don't really know what I would have done without this program. I think that being involved with this has given me purpose on this campus. I work and I have friends and I feel like I'm doing stuff, but gerontology has made me feel like what I'm doing is really going to make a difference, especially at Miami, because I can be a part of the gerontology club that raises money and I can help the residents in the community and it furthers my, like, I don't know, drive to do that throughout my entire life. You must be somewhere in London. You must be loving your life and the way. You must be somewhere. Too often, people with dementia in long term care facilities, everything's decided for them, and they don't make decisions, and they, it takes too long, it's too confusing. And this is the one hour where they get to decide everything on their own. So, choices are built in, opportunities for autonomy is built into the process, and then success is almost guaranteed. There's no other experience possible, I think, that brings together two very different generations where they both benefit from an interaction with each other. And it goes back to our core values of love and honor and how we interact with others. You see the very authentic relationship that they have formed and just how incredibly proud the artists are of the work that they have produced. You see them leave in a completely different mindset then they entered that room. It's our obligation to provide as rich and a full experience for these individuals who are suffering with dementia as humanly possible. The mission of the program is building bridges across age and cognitive barriers. So that bridge is actually relationship, and within that relationship, at the foundation is love.
people with intact cognitive all right i'm going to missions oftentimes try to free our here we go um i'm going to just talk for one second i think i gotta stop sharing my screen sometimes it okay i think i'm back <laughs> sometimes when you play a video it doesn't like you're going back to where you were at all right so just to kind of give you an overview to you, um, just the research that's been done on OMA's impact for both the volunteers and the older adults who have participated. Um, we found it improves the well-being of older adults living with dementia. It improves their mood. Um, they did studies comparing OMA to different uh, traditional arts activities. Um, and so, we looked at that way we and it was more of an observation um, style of those two papers. And then for, for students, we looked at their attitudes towards people living with dementia um, and how much they like, or the, the key term we use is allophilia, um, older adults living with dementia. So students gain this appreciation, this respect, and this liking of um, people living with dementia more after participating in OMA. And all of that research can be found on our website. Um, there's 13 published studies. So if you're curious about any of it, um, the most recent one came out at the end of last year. And we also have a new one, I'm not sure if it's up there yet, about our virtual program and comparing that to um, our in-person OMA program. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, but again, all available on our website, scripsoma.org slash research. You can see that here. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to Renee now to talk about their program and what they're up to. So hi, um, my, again, my name is Renee Griffin and I am the Creative Aging and Partnerships Officer for Senior Services in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Senior Services is a 501c3 that is um, located in uh, North Carolina. We've been in existence for, for over 60 years. And our mission is to help older adults remain at home for as long as possible and to help them age with dignity and live with purpose. Um, we currently have seven major programs that respond to the needs of older adults. Um, so um, everything from our Williams Adult Day Center to our um, Meals on Wheels program and Senior Lunch and uh, Living at Home, which is a CAPDA program, um, personal care assistance, and um, many, many other programs along that line. So OMA is really a new intervention that we have um, that we have integrated into our programming. Next slide. So um, it, I think to understand how and why we're using OMA, um, I'd like to provide a little bit of background about what we're doing. We have recently opened a new intergenerational center for arts and wellness um, on our campus. It is a 62,500 square foot building um, that is on the other end of our, of our parking lot. And it has uh, 21 partners, eight with dedicated space in the building, including our uh, award-winning Williams Adult Day Center. Um, Family Services has the Child Development Center in the building. Uh, the Sawtooth School for Visual Arts is a local nonprofit, very historic art school in this part of the country. Um, Winston-Salem State University, their health sciences department is located in the building. Both of our regional healthcare partners um, or providers in this, um, in this part of the state, Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Hospital and Novant Health are both located and have clinics in the building. Our local Hispanic League and Hands On Northwest North Carolina. Um, so we we knew that we were in the process of getting ready to enter a capital campaign to build this building, and um, prior to that, we 
Um, we applied for one of the Administration for Community Living's Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiatives Projects, uh, or ADPI projects, which we call locally memory connections. And what we sought to do in our proposal was to leverage the partnerships that we knew that were going to be present in the building so that we saw this as an opportunity not only to further our mission, but also to begin building those relationships with those important uh, community core partners. Um, we also believe very strongly at Senior Services that um, everyone thrives and has a better quality of life when they're in intergenerational in intergenerational relationships across the ages. Um, for some reason, we always have this tendency to put people in boxes and we put you know, the older people over here and the children over there and the teenagers in another corner, instead of realizing that we really all do much better and are happier when we have relationships with one another. And so, um, and then on top of that, we also really are focused on providing those kind of opportunities through the lens of arts and creativity towards the end of um, improving overall wellness. So for us, um, OMA was really a fit. When we were looking for evidence-based interventions to be a part of our project, we knew that OMA was a fit. It just aligned with everything that we was important to us and what we were trying to, to demonstrate. So what you see here is just an exterior picture of the new center. Uh, we opened in October and um, we had a ribbon cutting in November. So we've only been open for about four months. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit more information about our um, ADPI project, um, the focus of the project is to expand and improve existing dementia systems in our community. And from this graphic, you can see that we chose OMA to be one of the components of our project. And so um, we have three, we actually have three interventions in our program and our project. And, uh, but I want just you to know that we are utilizing the grant to cover the costs associated with OMA training for um, our facilitators and a portion of the staff salaries that are involved in the project as well as a of course, the art supplies. Next slide. So uh, this is one of our favorite pictures. Um, in fact, one year it was on the cover of our annual report, but it shows a volunteer who is supporting one of the participants at our Williams Adult Day Center, Miss um, Betty, in making her choices for her projects. So Miss Betty was at a very advanced stage of her of her dementia at this time, but she was still able to have meaningful interaction with another person and to create this no fail visual art project. So um, the volunteer there is not making choices for Miss Betty. She's simply supporting her in making those choices. Next slide. So this is um, an example of one of the pieces of art that was created. And so there's a little bit of a story behind it. When uh, Dr. Locom retired, her team at Scripps honored her um, with a virtual art show. And there were almost 500 pieces of art from all over the world that were submitted to be included in the show. And we were very proud and excited about the fact that two pieces created by artists at our Williams Adult Day Center were selected. So here's one that was titled by the artist as Sunshine. And here's another one that was titled, My Heavenly Garden. And this is um, a wall in the North Gallery of our center. It's the beginning. Our intent is to fill that entire wall with OMA art. And so this is just an example of a growing and permanent exhibit in the Intergenerational Center for Arts and Wellness. Next slide. So um, just some of the things that we've accomplished and learned, we are in the third year of our ADPI grant. Um, we are, the way we're using OMA in our project, it is um, implemented in three different locations. It's at our Williams Adult Day Center. Um, and it's offered every 10 weeks. We also offer OMA with, um, with our caregiver support groups as a part of the project. So while the caregivers are in their support group, 
OMA projects are conducted with their loved ones. So it's a form of respite. And we also have provided OMA in a few participant homes with a focus on people who are living with dementia and who also live alone. So to, um, to date, well, we've actually done a little bit more since I put this slide together, but um, to date we've had 45 unduplicated people who are living with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia participating in OMA, and they've completed really well over 400 art projects at this time. Um, some of the things that we've learned from the, um, from the evaluation tools that um, Megan referred to is that 20% 20, 20 of the participants reported, self-reported improved mood following their OMA session. And what we heard anecdotally from their families is that they carried that improved mood home and it made their evenings, uh, it made an impact on their lives together at home. Um, volunteers noted a small five, uh, five almost 6% increase in attentiveness during OMA. It was something that um, helped some people to engage. Of course, it really depends on where they are in their dementia journey. But 82% of volunteers reported that they had an increased sense of confidence around people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And so for us, that cuts really to the core of um, our purpose, again, of that intergenerational um, interaction, breaking down those barriers, and really, we hope, to uh, dismantling ageism. That's it. Thank you. I think we're going to do questions at the end, but if you have questions for Renee, um, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll come back to those. Thanks, Renee. I'm going to pass it on to Krista. Yeah, thank you so much, Renee. I love hearing about facilitators and what you're all doing wherever you are. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, a new center and to have OMA kind of integrated into that just is so heartwarming and exciting. And um, again, if you have experiences of what you're doing and how you're doing it, we would love to hear that as well. Um, I'm just going to go over kind of an overview of where we see support possibilities for you if you're considering uh, writing a grant to include into that. So kind of just some general costs for supporting the OMA program right away, um, the OMA facilitator training, OMA volunteer training, and then startup supplies. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of those individually. Um, but like Renee also mentioned, um, they have grant support for some salary positions, um, and then obviously just the programming itself. So um, there's nothing too small, like think big when you're creating your grant and what you need, um, the support that you need. Um, and then again, we're always here to help brainstorm with you if, if necessary. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So like I mentioned, the facilitator training and Renee said that they use this, um, they got some funding for this as well. So we have two formats. You can take the uh, the facilitator training fully online um, with live art making sessions. This is hosted by this um, OMA team at Miami. So myself, Megan and Amy, um, you go through a few weeks online, um, self-paced or a timed course with us. And then we do two days of art making together virtually. Um, and then the hybrid training is located, you can do this in Ohio, um, not currently at Miami, but we are thinking about picking that up again. But there is a location in Cleveland that does hybrid training. And then we have Art for the Journey in Virginia. And then um, Alberta, Canada also does hybrid training. Um, so that is that same set of, of three or four weeks online. And then you go to one of those locations for a day and a half of in-person training. Um, both formats are great. I'm an in-person person. Um, and I think, you know, it's nice to be able to get your hands dirty in a sense with the community. Um, so I, I personally love the hybrid model. Um, it kind of gives you that flexibility during the training, but then lets you um, get together with other people and you know, again, get your hands dirty, sit with volunteer or sit with artists, sit with other volunteers um, and complete your training that way. Um, so this is a thousand dollars per person. Typically, we recommend having at least two facilitators for your OMA programming. So again, just an area to build in for that grant budget, um, at a minimum of or about a two thousand um, dollars for two people. The other option, oh, the benefits of the facilitator certification. So um, you can receive 20 
0.5 hours of CEUs. Um, you receive an OMA binder. We just started a virtual training yesterday. Um, I refer to my OMA binder as my OMA Bible. I take it everywhere. I have multiple copies of it. Um, my husband is actually going through the training and I had to hand it over to him. I was like, if you mess this up, we're going to have problems. <laughs> um, it has everything you need to know. With that training, you also get a jump drive and then um, access to our online platform. Um, so really, we give you as much as possible. Um, and if something feels like it's not included, usually people just reach out and we we send it forward. Um, but you get 20 startup act or 20 art activities. Um, we teach you in the training how to also create more art activities, but typically, um, at least at definitely that first year, a lot of our facilitators just use those 20 provided. Um, the startup information, and then of course, tips for successful implementation. Um, there's release forms, uh, syllabus ideas, um, really uh, copies of the PowerPoint. Again, anything that you think that you may need for implementation of OMA is in that binder. Um, and then, of course, you're building a community and partnerships with um, other facilitators, with the OMA team, our uh, training centers, again, Art for the Journey in Virginia, Pear in Cleveland, and Alzheimer's Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Um, and there's over a thousand facilitators across the United States, Canada, and Indonesia. So um, it brings you part of that group um, and then helps you kind of figure out how you want to run your programming and finding volunteers in your area. Um, it, we break you out into smaller groups too throughout the training so that you then also meet facilitators going through the same process and maybe how they're diversifying their OMA program and what could work for them may also work for you. Um, so the whole thing is just a great learning experience. And then of course, at the end, you are certified to be able to take and run OMA wherever you are. Um, the other option or the other uh, training model would be the volunteer um, volunteer training for OMA. So yeah, thank you. Um, so volunteers are trained on a variety of topics. This is a huge part that we go over in the training as well. We first teach you how to be a OMA volunteer. Um, this is something that you can most certainly do on your own. You can train them on your own. We give you the resources to be able to do that. But then also... Um, OMA has a volunteer training on our website that you can purchase. So again, building that into your grant budget, um, that is $25 per person. Um, so you can kind of project how many artists and how many volunteers you want to have for the year and um, build out that cost for you. So um, the topics that volunteers go over is an overview of dementia, kind of giving them why they're there, um, the processes or the... the um, aspects of support that they may need to consider when working with someone with dementia. Um, we talk about the importance of art and why we do art as kind of our task orientation between the artist and the volunteer. Um, again, supporting someone living with dementia through that creative pr practice, giving them choices, um, helping them succeed in the project, but not doing the project for them. Um, of course, the importance of patience and imagination and relying on those remaining strengths versus um, those pieces that maybe no longer exist um, from the individual. So again, really just helping them be successful in the art program project provided for that day and then for multiple weeks in a row. Um, it the training really helps the students understand why they're there and the importance of their role. Um, of course, we love the art that's created out of OMA, but what we really hone in on is the relationship built between the, the volunteer and the older adult or the artist. Um, so the, the training just kind of gives them that, that starting point. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so again, just an overview of line items, I guess, in a sense that you could um, start thinking about for costs, startup supplies. So artist grade, Art, material, art supplies. Um, we always want a higher quality. You want a good pigmentation. You want um, success right off the bat. Um, and using artist grade supplies really helps um, your pieces look great. And then also your artists feel um, like they're creating with high quality materials. So we typically say about $2,000 is a great startup cost um, for supplies that gets you, you know, Say you have you want to start with 10, 10 artists and volunteer pairs. Um, you know it gets you the supplies for your first program, your second program. We're thinking a year long total. Um, 
paintbrushes, watercolors, paint, uh, aprons, all of that. Um, and we have, again, the full list is shared with OMA facilitators, but then we also have an Amazon list with pre-selected supplies to choose from. Um, and typically we say once you're, you've got kind of that big startup investment with supplies, you're looking at about three to $400 a year to maintain, um, again, for funding, but then, um, in the art show, like Megan mentioned, um, I think I talk about it later, but, um, there's the opportunity for fundraising and using the art show as a fundraiser. Um, so you can kind of recoup some of those supplies that way as well. Um, aprons and then other things to kind of brainstorm and think about what you're, you may need as you get OMA going space to conduct sessions. Um, a lot of, you know, like at Miami, we, um, have a studio where we have volunteers come and do playtime. So having a space outside of where we actually are programming, um, but then also if you need external space, um, storage or studio space would be great. Um, thinking about where are you going to put everything? Is it an office? Do you have shelving? Do you have boxes? Do you have a way to organize everything that you need for OMA specific? Um, the art show, like I mentioned, event materials, refreshments, you know, Megan showed those beautiful pictures. Um, they they eat, they drink, um, they a lot of the artists and volunteers receive corsages. The pictures are framed, the art is framed and matted, um, name tags and then certificates for everyone who was involved. So that's again another um, area of cost to consider. And then marketing materials, um, not only the art show, but also just OMA in general, getting out to your community, sharing what you're doing and why you're doing it and um, the support you need from people that maybe you don't always think about. Um, so being able to share the impact that you're having. Um, so to assist you with the application process, these are just, this is a quick list of things that we can provide. Um, so of course we have plenty of text available. Um, again, through the facilitator training, you receive a lot of that, but you may be writing this grant prior to going through the facilitator training. So if that's the case, um, definitely feel free to reach out to us. Our Website has a ton of great resources. Again, the the, um, the research articles are there. Um, it's mostly the abstracts, but so if you need more information on how to describe OMA um, implementation and evaluation of the program, we're happy to um, help with that and provide. Um, we also have evaluation materials, so um, scales for outcome measurement. Again, I mentioned the research citations, and then we're always open to conversations about um, working together, partnership opportunities. Um, if there's things that we can do for you through the grant process, or if you think a larger scale, something that you'd like to do together, um, we'd love to chat. Um, so then sustaining your OMA program, these are all just a, a list of things to think about. Um, connecting with volunteer groups, schools, and universities. Um, oftentimes we, we hear that volunteer recruitment can be one of the hardest things. OMA is already a lot going on, a lot to consider, um, a lot to plan and prep, um, and then finding the volunteers to support your programming. So diversifying that, you know, you don't necessarily have to go... Um, right across the street, even though there's a middle school. Like if you try them and it's not happening, you know, where else can you go? Who else can you connect with? Um, partnering with an artist in your area. So again, this could be like Renee was saying, they have a line item for staffing um, for salary. So finding an external person to come in and support OMA facilitating. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be you, the one running the program. You can have a person come in um, and, lead the sessions um, that you know you set up in a sense. Community fundraisers, um, you know, obviously again, the art show is a great place for that fundraising, um, auctioning off artwork at art shows. Um, but you can go bigger than that. You know, like earlier we were brainstorming, like you can walk into Chipotle and have a Chipotle night where you hand out flyers and you get 10% of those sales or things like that. Um, so finding other partnerships throughout your community. Um, you know, I think once people hear about OMA, they really love it. Um, you know, that video, no matter how many times I watch that, I still get goosebumps and love it. So, you know, sharing your personal experiences with OMA, sharing the video, um, people come out of the woodwork like, oh, how did I not know about this? Um, so that's what you, you share kind of the love and the pride of the program that you're running um, and find um, 
community donors in a different sense. And then, you know, donations from uh, family and friends as well. People who are experiencing the benefits of OMA with, from their loved ones, like Renee said, family members noticing um, benefits once the their loved one comes home from an OMA session. Reaching out to them, creating a community for them um, is really important and finding support through them as well. And it, it may not all be um, money driven and that's okay. There's plenty of other ways for you to partner with um, family and friends as well. So these are just, you know, again, a, a, a glimpse at opportunities that you can look at, um, ideas of where to think about funding for your program. Um, but again, we're always here to kind of have bigger conversations. I'm sure Renee is happy to answer questions. Um, and again, we would love to hear what you're doing with OMA. If it's different or maybe you think it's unusual or is it okay? Um, we love to hear the different ways that OMA is being implemented. So um, that's kind of the end of our little spiel. Um, there is contact info, um, but we'd like to open it up for questions if any of you have any. I did see question in the chat. Do you have any retraining, retraining for the OMA facilitators um, since OMA has different leaders? That's a great question. So currently there is just the one facilitator training, um, but we are exploring, um, like I mentioned, diversifying OMA in a sense of different places are doing OMA differently and we want to be able to support that. Um, we are going to be starting some like more frequent, I guess, hopefully, uh, webinars and just kind of general support points um, and creating, we, like, there are a, over a thousand facilitators. Um, we want to really hone in on that community and bring us together. So that is something we're actively working on. Any other questions or anything that Amy or Megan want to add in? And Renee, of course, you as well. We've got another comment in the chat from Levon. Grants for this program are hard to find in the Northwest. Any thoughts or recommendations? I think just from our our experience, we um, we found some luck with either community foundations just starting small, like if that's available to you, or. Um, Sometimes there's state-run art agencies that are interested in the same topic. So serving people living with dementia, they're often considered um, a population of people that is underserved in, in some cases. So you could look into that as well. Um, I'm trying to think of other, do you, do you have any ideas, Amy or Krista? Um, I would say also, I know here, um, there are grant opportunities available through our both our local arts council and our state arts council. And it's really, of all the interventions that we're using in our um, ACL funded project, OMA is not the most expensive one to implement. Mm -hmm. Although I would say we didn't originally plan on how much money we would need for supplies, mm -hmm. but um, it's really not that expensive. And it's I think it's easily sustainable. Um, once you've gone through that training, you've trained staff, um, you're really kind of just building, you're building your capacity as an organization. And we have a group that just started their training, a new new group started their training yesterday. And one of those people is not even um, an employee of our organization, but a community partner. Um, it's good for them, but we're also, we're leveraging their skill and their capacity to be the facilitator for all of our support group on the sessions. Thanks, Renee. Hi, Tammy. Hi. Um, let me put my hand down. Um, I just applied for my first grant and I work for a for-profit. So it was hard um, to try to even select a grant that I thought I qualified through through our county, but they said that even though we're for profit, we qualify. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I, I wonder how many grants there are for the for profit 
sector because our budget's like this tiny. <laughs> so, you know, grants are important. So I'm curious to see if they will, if, you know, I'll be able to receive those funds. But yeah, I'm wondering what that looks like for people that are for profit versus nonprofit. And then I just wanted to add, I'm studying to be a rec therapist and at the university, they're going to probably in the very near future, add a grant writing, a basic grant writing course, um, because that would be a very valuable skill to have for things such as this. So everything's kind of falling in line for me um, about grants. I see how important it is, but yeah, the, the for-profit sector, what do you know about that and grants? So my first thought is finding partners that also have a nonprofit, um, whether, I don't know what, what kind of organization you're with, Tammy. Senior living, it's senior living, so we're okay. for-profit. Um, but a, some grants require a for-profit entity, um, but it comes in as a partnership. So you would partner with a nonprofit mm -hmm. um, and then you would be the for-profit side. I've seen those. Um, mm -hmm. So um Interesting. Like hospices um, for cool. volunteer purposes, maybe if there's a nonprofit mm -hmm. hospice in your area, um, okay. but then also um, arts organizations or things like that is kind of my first thought. Yeah, because we have a lot of hospice providers that work in memory care. Okay, that's that would be interesting to research. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, we'll end, um, we'll just end with saying thank you and we'll share the slides to everyone who registered. So if you registered, thank you. Um, and we'll send the recording out as well. We'll also probably post it on our social media channels. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Our, I can put the email in the chat, but it's scriptsoma at uh, miamioh.edu. <laughs> and we will hopefully hear from you soon. If you do think of things, if you have questions, we'll do our best to answer, respond. Um, but hopefully we're you know, we're also trying to create this community of people to connect to each other as well. So if you're in the same area as someone or you know someone, maybe if you're already a facilitator, you train with somebody, hopefully you can connect up with them and maybe make a stronger case for supporting OMA in your community or a partnering with other organizations and um, making it bigger or just making your dementia friendly initiatives and bigger wherever you're at. So we appreciate your time. Uh, anything else, Amy, Krista, Renee? Okay. No, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.